Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich. Thoughts on John's First Epistle. By James Boyd. Chapter 1. It would, I am persuaded, be impossible for anyone possessing even in a feeble measure the knowledge of God, to think that anything could enter his creation unknown to him. Or that a thought could spring up in the mind of any intelligent being without his cognition. Every enlightened soul will gladly acknowledge, that from no quarter could the omniscient one be surprised by an enemy. Nothing could possibly be hid from him, before whom hell is naked, and destruction without a covering. At the same time the faithful heart revolts with horror from the doctrine that would make the holy and righteous God the author and inventor of the evil which has ruined his fair creation. Evil could not enter the creation without his knowledge and permission, but he is not the author of it, the devil is that, he abode not in the truth. He is a liar and the father of it. And this is just what sin is, it is lawlessness, and lawlessness is departure from the truth, for the truth is the right relation of everything to God. And sin is falsehood and departure from this, and becomes manifested in the lawlessness of the rebel creature. But although God is not the author of sin, but its judge, he, for his own wise purposes, allowed it to enter his dominions. He will make it serve him, and he will get glory to his great and holy name through it, and in the end banish it from his sight forever, and we may be sure enough of this. That were it not destined to serve the purposes of his heart, it could have gained no entrance. But it does serve him, not willingly, but in spite of the fact that it is an enemy it is made to serve him, as is every other creature, be that creature good or evil. Be it the horrible invention of the wicked mind of angel or of man, or be it the offspring of the goodness of God himself, everything must serve in the carrying out of the purposes of his love. And in nothing shall the creature be triumphant, for dust must be the serpent's meat, and every proud spirit must be humbled, and in the end come to learn, in the bitterness of eternal defeat, destruction and death, that all its profound plotting and restless wickedness have only been helping on the end the blessed God had in view from the beginning. He had his counsels, counsels of eternal love and blessing, and man was the object of them, and whatever he may have brought about by his own power or whatever he may have allowed the ceaseless activities of the enemy to accomplish, to one end he wrought, and to one end he made everything else to work, and that end was the fulfillment of those counsels of blessing. To this end he formed the worlds in the beginning, to this end he permitted sin to invade his fair creation, to this end he allowed man to fall under its power. And to this end he undertook to deliver him from his destroyer, the dread author and inventor of all evil. Man became corrupted by sin, fell under the power of the devil, became subject to death, degraded, and dishonored, yet God had purposed to have him in, sonship before his face, blameless, and holy, and in all his boundless love. He stands scarce an hour in the paradise in which he was placed in the goodness of God ere he becomes a wreck, and like a mighty tree struck by the lightnings of heaven and blasted. He but waits the moment when the withered trunk shall fall into the earth from which he was taken. But if man was to be in sonship before the face of God, the full revelation of God became a necessity, and also the introduction of another head for man. If God was to be known by his creature he must of necessity be declared, and he could only be declared by one who knew him. But where was the creature who could penetrate into the mystery of the Godhead? No one but one who was divine could have declared God, for no other could know him. If he is to be known he must manifest himself. Attributes of God had come to light in the past dispensations, and he made his goodness to pass before Moses, but what he was in his nature remained in obscurity. A divine person must come forth from that light unapproachable if the heart of God is to be seen and known. This is what has taken place in Christ. He was the Word, that is, the one in whom God has given expression to the thoughts of his heart. This, I suppose, is why the work of creation was his, for in the creation have been displayed the power and divinity of God, so that it is said, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, but the manifestation of his power and divinity, though it may leave the idolater without excuse, is not the revelation of his nature. This awaited the moment when the Word would become flesh and dwell among us. How very blessed it is to see all this. All that God is shines out in the lowly Jesus. He is Emmanuel, God with us. God was in his own world, visible amongst his creatures. There was nothing behind that revelation, nothing still shrouded in darkness, all was come to light in him who was a man of sorrows, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. An object of curiosity and wonderment to the fickle crowd that followed him, but the son of the living God to those whose eyes received the light, which shone from the Shekinah within, through the veil of his flesh. This revelation is perfect, and the light is truly the light of life. Its beams are life-giving. God was speaking to men in this life of righteousness, holiness, kindness, love, and self-sacrifice. 
it was not an angelic messenger with a fiery law, the declarator of his just demands, but God himself in the midst of his devil deceived, sin-stricken, and afflicted creatures. With all his almighty power commanded by the love of his heart for the salvation of the world. Righteousness was there in the midst of sin, love in the midst of hatred, God in the midst of men, and life in the midst of death. The fullness of the Godhead was there in the body of Jesus. There was nothing lacking. The sullen darkness might refuse to give place to the true light, and might still retain its stubborn sway over the minds of men, but the light has come to abide, and eventually the darkness must disappear. And the disciples had seen and heard him. They beheld his glory. They had seen what was peculiar to this man. They got an insight into the truth of his person, dignity, and lineage, which lay not upon the surface of his life of flesh. They got to see him in relation with God, an only son with a father. This was not apparent to everyone. It was perceived by the Father's revelation to his few faithful followers, and there they learned the nature, character, relationships, and love in which eternal life consists. Man is seen by his privileged disciples in the place given him in divine counsel before the world was. It is true no one was there but himself, but he was there, and there as man, neither was he in the actual and perfect condition purposed for man, for he was there in flesh and blood. And as to flesh and blood he was in relationships which were inconsistent with those in which eternal life is found, but this was only that he might be able, through death, to destroy its power. And bring us up out of death into those heavenly relationships in which he was alone in the days of his flesh. But, as I have been saying, and as we read in the epistle, the disciples behold his glory. Taught of the Father their vision penetrated through the earthly circumstances and relationships of the lowly carpenter's son, and they saw him in a relationship with God outside and altogether different from the old order. Whether of innocence or of guilt. It was not the beneficent creator, full of goodness, and his innocent, intelligent creature rejoicing in that goodness, but it was man in the full light of God, as son rejoicing in the Father's love. And everything here was divine. The love wherewith the Father loved him, was the same holy love which welled forth from his heart to the Father. The relationship was divine, the affections were divine, the nature and life were divine. Everything was of God, and not only of God in the sense that he was the creator of it, as he is the creator of every right relationship and affection, but this was morally, spiritually, and essentially of himself. This was the eternal life which the apostles had heard, seen, and handled, and it was into these relationships they were brought, and it was this love that filled their hearts. They tell us, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. I need hardly say, that as to the Father and the Son all this is measureless. There can be no limit in the case of divine persons, the volume of life must be infinite, and far beyond the comprehension of the creature. In our case it is different, we are but finite creatures, and our part in these wonderful things must be very limited, and even amongst ourselves, as compared with one another, there are different measures of apprehension. But what we apprehend and enter into, and enjoy, is the same thing, we live together in that holy circle of divine love. It is important, and I would beg my reader to notice, that however great our privileges and blessings are, and they are great indeed. They are never described in such a way as would lead us into the notion that we become deified. Our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son Jesus Christ. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, thy sent one, John chapter 17. It is God and man, Father and Son. So that although our blessed Lord has his place as a divine person in the Godhead, it is in his manhood we have part with him, and life eternal lies for us in the knowledge of the Father. And his sent one. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested. And we have seen it, and bear witness, and show, report unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that he also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son Jesus Christ. The desire of the Apostle's heart was that the saints might be brought to participate in those holy relationships and affections, in which they had found their life and enjoyment. And the relationships were those subsisting between the Father and his Son Jesus Christ, so that instead of man being introduced into the Godhead and deified, it is the nature of God brought into manhood in the person of the Son, of which the saints are made to partake. What they had heard, seen, and handled, was Christ himself. In the Son they had seen the Father, and to this revelation nothing could be added. All that God is in love came to light in him, above all in his death, for by this we perceive love, he laid down his life for us. The veil that concealed him exists no longer, the death of Jesus was the rending of the veil. When he was upon earth his body was the temple in which God dwelt, and when he died, all that dwelt in his body came out in manifestation. 
God has told out in that lowly man of sorrows all the infinite volume of the love of his heart. Whoever saw the Son saw the Father, and whoever saw the Son saw man in the relationship of Son with the Father, and in this lay eternal life for man. Man has his place in the full light of God, in intimacy with the Father, object of the Father's love, and this place is the believer's place in association with the Son. He calls his disciples his brethren, and says, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God, and John says, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son Jesus Christ. It is the blessed person in whom all this is seen in perfection who is brought before us in the Gospel of John, the light shines there in all its brightness. It shone before the eyes of men in the midst of darkness, and Jesus says, while ye have the light believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. In the epistle we get the children of light distinguished from those who are of the darkness by the fact that they come out in the moral characteristics of God. The fruit of the light, which is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, is seen in them, and no one else has any right to lay claim to eternal life. The first four verses of the epistle are introductory. The word of life in the person of Christ is what is before the writer's mind, what was from the beginning. We get a beginning in Genesis chapter 1, but not a beginning of anything that was to be eternal. Ruin came in upon that creation, and it seems that everything fell except the elect angels, who were maintained in the power of God. The earth also was prepared for man, and he fell, and once more darkness and chaos, this time moral, set in upon the earth. That was not the beginning for God. The true beginning was the advent of Christ into the world, for in him was the beginning of everything in a moral sense for God. In Christ, the Creator had entered his own creation, and this necessitated the reconstruction of everything, everything must now be remodeled. Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands, they shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. The only thing in creation that undergoes no alteration is the Creator himself. This blessed person, Jesus the Son of God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, shall lift up his voice in a coming day, and say, Behold I make all things new. The coming of the Creator into his own creation must be the beginning of a new order of things which never existed before. In Jesus the omnipotent Creator stands revealed in all the fathomless love of his heart in the midst of his creation. This marvelous blaze of holy light cannot be confined to man, though man in Christ be the object of it, but it must affect the whole universe. In the presence of the Son of God come into the world we are face to face with a new beginning, the beginning of everything for God. The disciples had witnessed this beginning. They had seen the Father effulgent in the Son, they had heard through the lips of Jesus the utterances of infinite and eternal love, they had contemplated his glory, the glory of an only Son with a Father. And their hands had handled of the word of life. It was no spiritual apparition, no chimerical and substanceless shadow, but a real man in flesh and blood, in whom the Father was fully revealed, and who stood rejoicing in the light of that revelation. And what they had seen and heard they reported to others, that, John says, ye also may have fellowship with us. On their part there was no hoarding up the blessing with selfish care, lest another should partake of it, and their store become less, but knowing the infinite and eternal character of this heavenly inheritance. They would desire the wide world to share in it, for such is the nature of divine love, the more your heart is in the enjoyment of it. The more you long that others should partake in it along with you, and the more you see others brought in to share the blessing, the greater is your joy. And the desire of the apostles, and the object John had in writing these things to the saints was, that they might partake with the apostles in these heavenly relationships and affections. And in this circle of life and blessedness have fullness of joy. At verse 5 we come to the message. This introduces the thought of responsibility, as the previous part brought before us the greatness of our privilege, therefore it is not the Father and his Son Jesus Christ, but God, the one by whom actions are weighed and who searches the hearts of his intelligent creatures, and the one who must judge everything that is not in moral accord with himself, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. This is where our fellowship is, it is in the light where everything is seen just as it really is, naked and open, where hypocrisy is at an end. For here there is nothing concealed or covered up, where not only every overt act is taken account of, but where every motive of the heart is manifest, and where everything is viewed with relation to God fully revealed no darkness at all. This is the death blow to everything that went before. The pretension of the Jew to be in the light must fall before this tremendous fact. This could not possibly have been said in the put dispensation, for they were characterized by darkness and obscurity, the true light was not then shining. 
In starlight, however cheering to the heart of the traveller plodding through the darkness, there is a great deal of obscurity, and the face of nature is but dimly discerned. And by the light of the moon many things remain unrevealed, and we are told that there are dark spots even in the sun, but in him there is no darkness at all. And it is in Christ that all this light is, for it is in him that God has come out of the darkness where he was hidden from the vision of man. Hence to be in the light is to have come to Christ and to have believed on him. The believer on Christ is in the light, but though the light shines today in all its strength the unbeliever abides still in the darkness, therefore if we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. There is no possibility of our having fellowship with him while the light in which he has declared himself is rejected. Where one wants to walk in the practice of self-will, and in the indulgence of the flesh, the light is avoided, and hated, but if such an one profess to have fellowship with him, it is all a lie. And the truth is not practiced, for he that practices truth, comes to the light. Christ, who is the true light, has attraction for him, and his deeds are seen to be the outcome of having to do with God revealed in his Son, instead of having their source in the depraved nature of man. But if we walk in the light, that is, as those whose consciences and hearts are under the power and influence of Christ, we have fellowship with one another. God is in the light, that is, manifested in Christ. And it is in the light this fellowship is enjoyed, for it is in the light all true believers are, and it is there we have everything in common. And we are there in the value of the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from all sin, otherwise the light would be intolerable to us, for no one could be there without discovering his natural sinfulness. And this would be more than we could bear, were it not that we know that the flesh has been brought to an end in the judgment of his cross. But knowing this, the light can be enjoyed, although the truth be in us which gives us to take account of ourselves as God sees us. But whatever we see in ourselves, and we will discover no good in our natural selves, whether it be sin in the flesh, or sin in the act, there is no reason for us to practice self-deception. For the blood is the witness that both have been brought to an end in the unsparing judgment of God. In the light of God hypocrisy has no place, truth is in the inward parts, and instead of sins being covered up, they are confessed, and God. Faithful to the attitude in which he presents himself to us in this day of grace, and just on account of the blood of Christ which was shed for the remission of sins, forgives us. And cleanses us from all unrighteousness, that is, he not only removes from our consciences that which has brought a cloud between our hearts and the face of God, but he enlightens us as to the point of our departure. And the cause of our failure, and he ministers that grace to us which we so much need, so that not only the gross forms of fleshly evil may be judged, but that our natural energy and zeal which is worse than worthless in the things of God, may be disallowed, and that distrust of ourselves, and prayerful dependence upon himself, may take the place of every confidence in self, so that the enemy may in future get no point of attack, and the result may be practical righteousness. How good it is to be in his hand, and to know that in all his patient dealings with us his great object is to bring us out in moral suitability to himself. He abhors sin, and he will teach us to abhor it, it is ruinous to us, but he will deliver us from its dominion, and enable us to avoid it. He loves righteousness, and he works in us by his Holy Spirit, that we also may love and practice it. When he laid hold of us at the first, that we might be for himself, we were nothing but sinners, and should we say we have not sinned, it would be flagrant rebellion against his word. Which declares that all have sinned, and in making the assertion, we would be making him a liar, and it would be seen that his word was not in us. How dreadful! To what terrible lengths the wickedness of man will carry him!